Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to discuss one of the great biochemical pathways of all time, and that is the second part of photosynthesis. Sometimes it's called the dark reaction, uh, sometimes it's called the Calvin cycle, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and so let's get right into that conversation. So what's interesting about the Calvin cycle, just to start off with this right out of the gate, is that it's named after uh, this individual right here, Melvin Calvin. And this is a Nobel Prize winning scientist. He, he won the Nobel Prize in 1961. He was working with his colleagues uh, really in, starting all the way back in the 1940s. Can you believe it? Um, he was working at the University of California, Berkeley. And he was trying to determine the pathway that led to the production of sugar in photosynthesis. And so what a great experiment. And so we're, in this video, we're going to be talking about his experiment. We'll be talking a little bit about the cycle that he was able to discover. And so what an achievement. And so, um, you know, sort of like in giving honor to, to Krebs in the Krebs cycle, we're going to give it up for, for, uh, for Calvin. And so basically what I'm going to tell you, uh, long story short, is that the Calvin cycle is going to use the energy of ATP that, if you recall, is produced in the light reaction and the reducing power, the reduced coenzyme NADPH. And it's going to take uh, those electrons, basically, and that energy it helped to turn carbon dioxide into sugar. And so, as you know, sugar is highly energetic, and so to convert glucose, I mean, to carbon dioxide to sugar, it's gonna require that kind of energy. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about. And so, uh, start off by looking at a uh, typical, what is a C3, and I'll explain what, what that means in a moment, a C3 uh, cross-section leaf anatomy. Here's your Here's your uh, dermal layer, your epidermis or dermal tissue, a single cell layer, upper and lower. The middle layer is sometimes called mesophyll. It's basically your typical plant cell or, or uh, parenchyma cell. Sometimes it's also referred to as. And up here it's in as palisade arrangement, which is great for capturing the maximum amount of sunlight. So the sun's coming from above, and so it'd be difficult for the sun to get past. And so down here, you can notice it's kind of spongy in the, in the mesophyll. And so that allows for carbon dioxide, which is the main character today, carbon dioxide to diffuse into the leaf. And when it gets into the leaf, it's able to circulate. And so this is where photosynthesis is taking place. And, and like, where, where? Well, in each of these cells, in each of these cells, those little tiny dots that you could see are chloroplasts. And inside the chloroplast is where photosynthesis is taking place. And so it's pretty awesome. Um, so here's a little bit more descriptive of a picture. Here's your epidermis, the cuticle, which resists transpirational losses. And then here's that sort of middle layer right here. And so in each of these circular structures called chloroplasts is where we're going to be talking about that's where the Calvin cycle is occurring inside a plant cell inside the chloroplast. But then how does CO2 come in? It comes in via a pore called uh, a stoma or stomata. And then as the sugar is produced, then that travels down into the vein uh, in a specialized vascular tissue, tissue called phloem. And so that's kind of cool too. So how does CO2 enter into the, into the leaf in the first place? Well, let me draw you back over here. Do you see this lower epidermis? It has these two guard cells which create like kind of a, a mouth or the stoma. This is looking up at that. And so the epidermal cells are kind of like puzzle pieces. Notice they're not, they don't have any chloroplasts, but the guard cells do. And so literally CO2 enters into a leaf through those pores, through those little mouths. And it leaves in the form of sugar, but it doesn't fall out of the stoma in the form of sugar. As I was mentioning before, the sugar leaves the leaves uh, in the vein. And so that's kind of cool. Here's a picture of, a color picture of plant cells, typical parenchyma cells uh, in the mesophyll of a leaf. These green bodies are chloroplasts. The green structure is really important um, because the green pigment chlorophyll, here's a, a transmission electron micrograph of this, it's the thylakoids, 
let me come over here and go green here. It's those thylakoid membranes uh, that are green because they contain the pigment chlorophyll. But my point of this is that you really need, in order to discuss the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle, it you need the power of the light reaction. And so the thylakoid is capable of producing, in the light reaction, it's capable of producing ATP. Uh, it employs an electron transport chain to do so. And it, it also produces oxygen, which is not going to be part of the Calvin cycle. And it also produces NADPH. And so these two products of the light reaction are going to be needed in the dark reaction to power the production of sugar. And you're like, well, where's the CO2? The CO2 is going to be diffusing into a plant cell, so we're already in a plant cell, and then it's going to simply be diffusing into the chloroplast. CO2 easily diffuses in because it's small and nonpolar. So where is the Calvin cycle occurring? The Calvin cycle is going to be occurring in, the, in this middle area called the stroma. And so I, I draw it as a circle because it's cyclic in nature, as we'll look at. But it requires the input of NADPH, ATP, and carbon dioxide. And so these are the inputs to the Calvin cycle. And so this is literally where it's occurring inside the chloroplast. Pretty cool. And so here's a cartoon of what we we're just looking at. And so as I was describing, water is obviously needed. I didn't mention it before. Water is needed to provide the electrons uh, to replace the electrons lost by chlorophyll that are now stored in the reduced coenzyme NADH, NADPH. And so these two products right here, ATP and NADPH, are going to be used in the Calvin cycle in the stroma with the help of CO2 to produce sugar. Okay, so these go hand in hand. Photosynthesis is in, you know, in two, two processes, the light reaction and the dark. Although sometimes the dark reaction is a misnomer for a beginning student of biology because it sort of implies by its name that it occurs in the dark. But maybe a better way of, of describing the Calvin cycle is that it's light independent, meaning that it doesn't require light directly, but it does require light ultimately for it to produce ATP and NADPH. And so both the light and the dark occur in the light of the day. <laughs> so I hope that's clear. And so the cycle spends the, the energy of ATP and NADPH to make sugar, and that's basically what we're doing. And so, um, you know, while the light reaction occurs in the thylakoid, as I was describing before, here's the thylakoids, really the dark reaction is occurring right here in the stroma. So the stroma is the fluid, and so the Calvin cycle is going to be occurring in the stroma. I'll put little arrows like this. So this is the stroma, and then again the thylakoids are important because they're the ones that are producing uh, ATP, uh, NADPH, and that's going to be used here. And you're like, well, this is inside the chloroplast, and then we also need, of course, an input of carbon dioxide. And so this is where, this is the location. So that's important. So a little shout out for Melvin Calvin and his colleagues that were working at the University of California. You know, how did they go about discovering uh, or elucidating that pathway? Well, rather cleverly, I think. They were growing algal cells. So they were growing algae in these, in these sort of like aquaria here. And so you're like, well, this isn't your typical aquarium. There looks like a lot of tubing in here. And so a lot of this tubing is because uh, Professor Calvin was introducing carbon dioxide. So there's gas bubbling in, in these aquaria. And what's interesting about it, notice how he has a light bank back here because you need light for the, to discover the dark reaction of photosynthesis. That's <laughs> really emphasizing that. Uh, but he was pumping in CO2, and the, the cleverness about his experiment is that um, Professor Calvin knew that carbon dioxide, I'll just draw it out over here, carbon dioxide uh, has carbon in it, of course. It's a source of all organic molecules in the plant. Um, but he also knew that carbon dioxide can come in a couple of different isotopes. There's C12, CO2, and then there's C14, CO2. And then you might know that C14 is radioactive. And so he used 
radioactive CO, CO2, radioactive CO2 or C14 CO2, and then he was able to allow that carbon dioxide, and this will become a little bit more clear when we look at the pathway in particular, but he was allowed the plants to take in, the algae to take in that, that gas, and then he was able to arrest the pathway by killing the algal cells in certain time intervals with, with a, a strong alcohol solution. So as it turns out, if you only allow the, the algae to experience CO2 just for a little bit of time and then kill them, and then a little bit longer of a time and kill them, he was able to then purify the molecules for which had those radioactive isotopes. And so again, let me just do it like this. I'll just make it really simple like that. And so here's like a little pathway, right? And so if you give it a short amount of time, the carbon dioxide will, will be present here, or the, or the radioactive C will be present here, and then a little bit more time, it'll be present here, but not present. And then a little bit more time, it'll be present here, a little bit more time, it'll be present here. And so by looking at these time intervals, he was able to determine the steps of the pathway, because that's what we're talking about, the steps of the pathway, by looking at algal cells and radioactive isotopes. So he was working with carbon-14 isotope. And so sometimes these radioactive isotopes are referred to as tracers, because again, you can trace the pathways. And he had colleagues uh, helping with him, uh, helping him with this. And one of them in particular I want to highlight is Andy Benson. Sometimes the cycle is called the Calvin-Benson cycle as a result of the, those contributions. Although Melvin Calvin was the only one to receive the Nobel Prize, sometimes it's called the Calvin-Benson cycle. And so he was able to map the complete route that carbon takes when it starts off in carbon dioxide all the way into the conversion to carbohydrate. And so that's what we're about to talk, talk to you about today. Okay, and so that's pretty cool. And so it begins, as I was mentioning before, with CO2, and I just want to emphasize that. This is how carbon enters the ecosystem. It's in the air, and, and plants are able to take it in and stick it into an already existing sugar in the plant cell. And so what we call that, when, it, it takes car when the plant takes carbon dioxide and, and incorporates it, it fixes it. So this is called carbon fixation. So this is the first step of the Calvin cycle, it's carbon fixation. It, it has to be, this is where carbon simply diffuses into the stomata. This is the lower epidermis. So this carbon fixation process is of equal significance as nitrogen fixation, where a special bacteria are capable of doing that, where they pull nitrogen gas right out of the air and fix it to hydrogen to produce uh, ammonia, nitrogen fixation, which is the entry of nitrogen into the nitrogen cycle. This is equally as important. This is how carbon enters the ecosystem. I just want to completely emphasize that. And so what happens in, that, in the very first uh, reaction of, of the Calvin cycle is carbon fixation. So carbon, which is emphasized here, CO2, so again, you know, if you wanted to like get into it, you can say CO2 is a is a linear molecule like that. That's fine. So carbon dioxide is fixed, meaning it's stuck to. Like if I'm fixing a piece of paper to the wall, I'm going to stick it to the wall with that adhesive tape. So carbon is fixed to an already present in the stroma sugar, and this sugar is called ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, ribulose bisphosphate. It's sometimes called RUBP. And again, what is it? It's a five-carbon sugar. Uh, it, it, it is a ketone. Um, as, you, as you see over here, it has two phosphates, and thus the name bis. So it's RUBP. And so when you stick a carbon onto a five-carbon sugar, you obviously produce a six-carbon molecule. Now, this is called a, an intermediate because what happens is it quickly, ever so quickly, fractures into two three-carbon molecules, okay? And so I'll get to that in a moment. What is the enzyme right here? What is the enzyme right here that catalyzes carbon fixation? In other words, in its active site, can grab carbon dioxide and stick it 
to that 5-carbon sugar, uh, ribulose bisphosphate. It's a very, very important enzyme. It might be, uh, again, you have to temper this if you, if, if you know me, with I have a tendency to have a, a little hyperbole once in a while. Uh, it might very well be the most important enzyme in biology. It's certainly one of the most ubiquitous proteins. It's found in all photosynthesizing organisms. Uh, and one might say, because of the fact that it's present in autotrophs, it's such a large quantity, it could very well be the most abundant protein on the earth. And what is it? What is it? Well, it's RUBP, because again, you're naming it after the substrate. It's RUB carboxylase. It's sometimes fondly known as Rubisco. So RUBP carboxylase is known as Rubisco. So that enzyme catalyzes carbon fixation. In other words, the sticking of carbon dioxide to a 5-carbon sugar ribulose bisphosphate. And what it does is it produces, again, the 6-carbon intermediate. And so here's a, a computer-enhanced um, X-ray crystallography model of Rubisco. A lot is known. You can see here is the tertiary structure. And you can see, see the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet, pleated sheet in there. And so CO2 and RUBP go into that active site. And what comes out is this. So what I'm going to say is that I'm going to discuss the Calvin cycle in three phases. And I'm going to call the fir very first phase something called the carbon fixation phase. And that's what I've been talking about. And then I'm going to uh, talk about a second phase and a third phase. And the second phase is going to be using the reducing power of ATP and NADPH. And then the third phase is I'm going to talk about how it recycles R, uh, RUBP again. So it's a regenerative kind of phase. So let's look at this first phase. So this, these, th this sugar that I was talking to you, uh, um, RUBP, is present in the, in the stroma. So again, here's where we are in the stroma of a chloroplast in the middle of one plant cell in the middle of a leaf. Okay, so here's the thing. In order to produce, in order to produce glucose, we have to talk about like glucose, as you know, has. Let me. Do, I'll just write it out. As I'm saying, as you know, but I'll just say it. Glucose has six carbons in it, and so in order for that to be produced, you're going to need the input of six carbons into the Calvin cycle. Doesn't that seem reasonable? I think it does. And so what we like to do is when we consider the Calvin cycle, we like to consider it not in terms of, of going around six times, but we can consider it in a, in a group of three carbon dioxides at a time, and it needs to go around twice in order to, to produce glucose. So let's, let's consider this three carbon dioxides come in, so that's three carbons, and it's connecting to, obviously there, four, three five-carbon sugars, okay? So if you have, if you attach the carbon dioxide to those three, what you'll have is three six-carbon intermediates, okay? There's going to be three of them, so there's going to be three of these guys, okay? There's going to be three. So three CO2 and three of the sugars, I'll write it out. So it's three CO2s and three of these, and you're gonna make three of these. Okay, that's obvious. Okay, you're sticking three of them on there. So there it is, three of them. But watch this. If you fracture that intermediate into two, what you really have is, and I shall erase, you'll have two three carbon molecules, two of those and two of those. Does that make sense? So Check this out. When you, when you look at it this way, since three CO2s are coming in, you're going to have a total of six. You're going to have a total of six altogether, three carbon molecules. Okay, because you would have had three, you would have had three six carbon molecules. And since you're going around uh, twice, Overall, to produce glucose, you're going to have six three carbon molecules called three phosphoglycerate. Okay, so that's carbon fixation. So there's six of them. So as it turns out, it requires um, 
ATP from the light reaction. And what's basically what ATP is doing is it's adding its high energy uh, phosphate to the molecule. And so what that's doing is now we're going to look at the, what, what I'm going to call the second phase, which is the, sort of the reduction phase where you're adding energy to the sugar. So the energy is being added to the sugar. And so now you're going to make a 1,3-bis phosphate glycerate. Okay, so that's what that is. And then you're going to use the reducing power of NADPH. And so 1,3-bis uh, phosphate glycerate is going to get gain electrons. And so it's going to get reduced. And so who's going to get oxidized? The NADPH gets oxidized. And also, in, the, in so doing, you're also removing some phosphate. And doing it. And so the product of this second phase is a, th is a three carbon sugar called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, or sometimes it's called phosphoglyceraldehyde, or PGAL, or GAP. So it's glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. I don't know if you recall that, uh, it's the sugar found in glycolysis as well. So are you ready for this? This three carbon fragment right here is a sugar and that sugar is the true end product of photosynthesis and what I mean by that I'll explain that in a moment but it's a three carbon molecule and there's six of them okay so there's six of them and so as it turns out of the six one of them leaves the cycle okay one of them leaves the cycle and so now you would have five okay five three carbon, because there's three carbons, one, two, three. So there's five three carbons. Now, you have to then, over here on this side, you have to get it back to where there's what? Three five carbons. And so do you see how this is five three carbons? So ultimately, that will produce, if you will, 15 carbons. And this is also 15 carbons. Here with 16 carbons. Okay, so now what you're doing is you're regenerating that sugar back to RUBP. Now you might notice this only has one phosphate over it, over here, so you're going to also need an input of ATP. So let's let's consider that. So uh, during the reduction phase, just to, to be more clear about it, so those the three phosphoglycerate receives a phosphate from ATP, so it's it's becoming more energetic. So it's the bis phosphate glycerate. And then it also gains electrons, and so it becomes reduced. And how did, it, how did it gain them? NADPH did that. And so basically what it's doing, it's making it more energetic. It's reducing the carboxylic acid group to a carbonyl group, to be detailed about it. And then, as I mentioned, one of the, one of the six gaps leaves the cycle. Okay, and so that C3 leaves. But the other five, which is a total of 15 carbons, have to be, remain in the cycle to regenerate the three RUBPs. Now, I say three because there's three five carbon. So if you have five three carbon, it's the same thing. There's 15. And so check this out. This is, this is what GAP looks like. This is glyceraldehyde phosphate or GAP, or PGAL, phosphoglyceraldehyde. This is the three carbon end product of the Calvin cycle. It's the actual sugar made in photosynthesis. It isn't glucose. Glucose is technically made when you take two glyceraldehyde phosphates and attach those together. So three and three is six. That is why the Calvin cycle needs to go around twice, okay? Okay, so this is what RUBP looks like. It's a five carbon sugar and it has two phosphates on it. So this is what we have to regenerate because it's a cycle. Remember the very first substrate in the reaction was this sugar? So you have to take the five remaining uh, gl glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecules and rearrange them in order to produce the RUBP. So you're going to need more ATP to do that because it only had one phosphate on it. And so the very last part of the cycle regenerates the starting material although three of the carbons left. And so again, here's the whole cycle in its entirety. So let me try to, to emphasize this again. So if we have six of these molecules and we let one escape, there's going to be five remaining right here. And so we rearrange those, bam, 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 like that. Steps are not shown. And then we add some ATP 
these 15 carbons are back up here so we can regenerate the RUBP. But in so doing, those three CO2s ultimately are right over here in this gap molecule. So that's why it has to go around twice because then you would produce another gap over here and then one gap plus another gap will produce the six carbon glucose. But that's tangential to, I, I hope that's a word, it's tangent to the Calvin cycle proper. So the true end product of the Calvin cycle is glyceraldehyde phosphate or phosphoglyceraldehyde or GAP. It's a three carbon sugar. Okay, and so it's broken up in three phases. Okay, and so there you go. So carbon dioxide keeps coming in. So it costs CO2 to produce sugar, of course, but it also costs uh, ATP and NADPH in order to uh, create the glucose and then really all the other carbohydrates that are um, offshoots of that. And you're, you're going to need the reducing power of nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide, phosphate in order to do that as well. And so this is another look at the Calvin cycle. So again, the CO2 comes in, the Rubisco grabs it and fixes it to this short-lived intermediate, one, two, three, four, five, six. And of course, there's three of them. But then if you fracture it, boom, there's going to then be two of these. So do you see how there's three of them? So if you fracture it, there's going to be a total of six. So that's important. So six of them, then six of them, and then six of them, glyceraldehyde phosphate or GAP, and then ooh, one of them takes off. Then you have five, and then those beep, 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 regenerate back into this. And then glucose is then produced tangential over there. Okay, so there you have it. So each turn of the Calvin cycle fixes, really, you know, if you're being truthful about it, fixes one carbon at a time. So the cycle needs to go around, you can say six times, or you can say it goes around twice if you're looking at uh, a triad of CO2. So you can say three come in and it has to go around twice. So that's one way to consider it, okay? And so the, the, it ha you know, for, in order to do that, the cycle has to go around and it has to fix these, you know, if you're looking at it one at a time, it has to go around three times in order to make one gap then it has to go around three more times in order to make another gap, which then makes sugar six times. <laughs> so I hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, all right, so this is another summary of it, how it's the first phase is carbon fixation, and then you use the power of the light reaction to, to make the sugar more energetic, and then you regenerate RUBP. So it has to go around a total of six times. Okay, and so the energy of photosynthesis uh, comes from, and the, the Calvin cycle comes from the light reaction, and so that's important. And so uh, Calvin, again, uh, re really impressive, working with algae, 1961, Nobel Prize, Calvin Benson cycle, and I, I should also mention the other colleague, which is Basham, and so uh, Basham, and so that, that's uh, Melvin Calvin right there, and looking pretty proud of himself. And so let's take a look over here. I think it'd be useful to see a little animation of what we've been talking about. And let me see if I can uh, also help to narrate it. And so here you have a look at the, uh, let me pause that here and bring it back. Let me go here, okay. So here we have the Calvin cycle. So we're using the, the reducing power of NADPH and the ATP from the light reaction and that comes from the thylakoids and so where are we now we're in the stroma so that's pretty cool and uh, let's get that going it's much better when it's actually moving so the first phase is carbon fixation and notice how they're they're describing this in, in a packet of three and so these are the three uh, RUBPs bisphosphate so there's carbon fixation, like uh, scramble, 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 and then you get six three carbon uh, phosphoglycerate mo molecules, three phosphoglycerates. And then you're gonna use a little bit of ATP from the light reaction, right? So there's gonna be some energy consumption and uh, a redox reaction. And so, as it turns out, this is the reduction phase at this point, 
we're using the power of ATP to stick on there. Look at that. And so now all of them have two phosphates on it. Okay. And then you're going to use some of that reducing power of NADPH. And so these sugars are then going to gain the energy from that molecule. Okay. And so there they are gaining the energy. Uh, a phosphate is removed. And so out, out of these six uh, gap molecules, which is the final product of the, of the Calvin cycle, five of them continue on, but one of them exits. Watch this. One of them takes off. Ooh, there, there it is. Uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. But then the other 15 carbons, then with the help of ATP, so that produce and regenerate the three RUBPs. And there you have it. And so it, it, it almost looks simple. I, I wouldn't say that it is, but it, when, you, when you treat it like that, it, and it, animation really makes it easy to understand. Here's your three carbon, uh, your, your three five carbon sugars, RUBP. We're in the stroma. Notice how there's two phosphates. Hey, look at that, carbon fixation. So the six, and then we break it up. And so now there's six three carbon molecules. And we use a little NADPH. We use a little ATP. So this is the second phase of the Calvin cycle right there. And then out of those six, one of them leaves, gap. And then those others regenerate. And so then you go around another time. So you then have six, and then five leave, and then hey, do you like that? Glucose is produced, and then you could see the glucose could start linking together, and that might make sucrose a disaccharide, or it could make a big chain of glucose in the form of starch. It all depends what the cell wants to do. And so all of that is happening in the stroma of one chloroplast. The light reaction is in the thylakoids, the stroma is doing the, the Calvin cycle the help of the sun. And then how about this? This is, should be noted. Maybe the glucose, when it's produced, is then undergoes glycolysis in the cytoplasm, which is converted into pyruvic acid, which then goes into the mitochondria. And you can use the oxygen from the light reaction for oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria to produce ATP. So maybe the cell's doing that. But, you know, it's producing a lot of sugar, it's producing a lot of energy, and it's producing a lot of oxygen. So much so that the oxygen can simply diffuse out of, this is oxygen, diffuse out of those mesophyll cells. And now we're in that airspace. And there's so much oxygen that it literally leaves the stomata and it goes up into the atmosphere and you're breathing it right now. So that's really important. And some of the extra sugar is stored within, not necessarily in the leaf, you could actually store it into a, a structure called a fruit, and there, therefore that might entice an animal to come and eat it and then disperse the seeds. How do you like that for, for symbiotic relationship? And so I hope you enjoyed the Calvin-Benson cycle and uh, a, an in-depth look at the uh, biochemical pathways of the dark reaction of photosynthesis. Thanks for watching.